Hello, welcome to this teach, which is going to be on the differential diagnoses for a patient presenting with gradual loss of vision. So in this video, we'll be looking at the important differentials for a medical student to be aware of for patients presenting with gradual loss of vision. We're starting with age-related macular degeneration, then cataract, diabetic retinopathy, chronic open-angle glaucoma, and retinitis pigmentosa. And we won't cover it in this teach, but just remember, it's always important to rule out refractive error causing uh, a loss of a patient's vision. So do they need any glasses or correcting contact lenses, anything like that. So let's start then with age-related macular degeneration. This is a condition where there are ageing changes to the macula in the eye without any obvious precipitating cause. It happens in people over the age of 55 years. It's a progressive and chronic condition and is one of the leading causes of blindness worldwide. And in the West, it's the most common cause of blindness. Uh, we've got a picture here of a normal fundus to show you, mind you, what it looks like. So this is a normal fundus in a 35-year-old patient, healthy patient, uh, and you can see the optic disc is normal, there's no swelling or abnormal pallor, and the cup to disc ratio is around 0 0.35, so that would be normal. We'll talk about that later on. The vasculature is all normal, uh, and if you look in the middle of the picture, you can see the darker area, which is the macula, and the red spot, which is the pobia centralis, which is the highest area of visual acuity of the eye, the area where there's only cone cells. So this is a normal one, and later on we'll be looking at uh, some abnormal fundus pictures. So back to age-related macular degeneration, there are two types, there's dry or atrophic macular degeneration, and wet or neovascular macular degeneration. Most of them are dry, so 80% are dry and 20% are wet, and we'll talk about these in more depth now. So let's look at the layers of the eye now in a bit more detail. So we've got the sclera there on the outside. Next we've got the choroid, then the retinal pigment epithelium. And now we'll just broadly classify this into the neural retina. So this is the photoreceptors, horizontal cells and ganglion cells with all the nerve fibres. And this is the bit we're interested in with macular degeneration. So we want to look at the choroid and retinal pigment epithelium. So we'll zoom in on that a bit more. So that's the choroid, and now we want to look at the choroid in more detail. So we'll zoom in again on that so we can see the different layers. So here we can see how the choroid is separated into different layers. So you've got Haller's layer, which is the larger blood vessels, Sattler's layer, or a bit smaller, choriocapillaris, as it sounds like, a capillaries, and Brooks membrane is a membrane that separates the choroid from the retinal pigment epithelium. So let's look at dry macular degeneration. So the key finding in dry macular degeneration is drusen. And this is a buildup of extracellular matrix and inflammatory deposits within Brooks membrane. So normally Brooks membrane is responsible for monitoring what goes in and out of the retinal pigment epithelium. So it allows nutrients into it and waste from the retinal pigment epithelium and the photoreceptors back across into the blood vessels of the choroid. And with age, you get the deposition of these extracellular matrix deposits within this membrane which, as you can imagine, impedes the ability of nutrients to go across into the retinal pigment epithelium and photoreceptors and impedes the ability to bring waste back. And drusen can be classified into hard or soft drusen. So hard drusen are small, they're well demarcated, and it's normal to get these with age. Whereas soft are larger and look more like cotton balls, and they're always pathological, another finding of uh, dry macular degeneration. In more advanced dry disease, you can get a condition known as geographic atrophy. And this is when there's loss of retinal pigment epithelium and photoreceptors, so they die off um, due to large areas of drusen, which completely impede the ability to get nutrients across. So there you've got large areas of drusen building up, and that impedes the ability to get nutrients from the choroid into the retinal pigment epithelium. So the retinal pigment epithelium dies, and then the photoreceptors overlying them die as well. So to just summarise that here, uh, dry age-related macular degeneration, the key findings are drusen in early disease and a very advanced disease, geographic atrophy. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of these now. So here we've got a picture of drusen within a patient with macular degeneration. You can see the little yellow spots uh, around the macula in the centre of the eye. So they're both hard and soft drusen. And here we've got a patient with geographic atrophy, so you can see the well demarcated yellow area. 
you can imagine it being sort of in a in the shape of an island or something like that. Um, so this is occurs in a more advanced disease due to loss of the retinal pigment epithelium and overlying photoreceptors. So moving on now to wet age-related macular degeneration. This again has something to do with Brooks membrane, uh, and this time it's to do with uh, its angiogenesis. So normally Brooks membrane produces anti-VEGF molecules, and they stop VEGF from the retinal pigment epithelium crossing into the choroid and producing neovascularization. And unfortunately with age, the Brooks membrane gets thinner, and it reduces the number of anti-angiogenic proteins it produces, and that increases the risk of neovascularization occurring. And then, unfortunately, that's what happens. So you get neovascularization of the choroid underneath the retinal pigment epithelium. And as usual, these blood vessels aren't very good. They're quite leaky. Fluid leaks out, and they can push the retinal pigment epithelium away from the underlying choroid. The retinal pigment epithelium gets pushed away. This can lead to death of the photoreceptors in the pigment epithelium cells, as they can't be supplied by the choroid that lies underneath it. So going back to the summary slide, we've got wet macular degeneration is due to choroidal neovascularization. And the way I remember this is to think of dry as drusen, both start with D. And less good, not quite as good a mnemonic, but uh, blood is wet, so that works for me. Obviously there might be other ones that you find useful as well. So here we've got some fundus pictures of wet macular degeneration. You can see in this one some uh, subretinal hemorrhage, superiorly of the macula, and nasally as well. And you can also see a well demarcated grey area, uh, in, which is found in wet macular degeneration. In this next picture we have a more striking subretinal hemorrhage, just to show you sort of the variety of presentations. So let's move on now to risk factors for age-related macular degeneration. These work for both dry and wet. Obviously, it's in the title, we've got age. The older you get, the more likely you are to get macular degeneration. Smoking is also a major risk factor. Low activity, a family history, and for wet age-related macular degeneration, being Caucasian increases your risk as well. And how will the patient present? It may be an incidental finding on a visit to an optometrist, or it may be due to reduced visual discrimination, so struggling to see uh, faces uh, with driving or with reading. Less common symptoms are things like night glare, photopsia, so flashing lights, visual hallucinations, as Charles Bonnet syndrome is an example of that and poor dark adaptation, adaptation due to loss of rod cells. In advanced disease, the patient might present with a central scotoma. Obviously, the macula is responsible for central vision, so loss of the macula can lead to uh, poor processing of the image there. And the disease will progress differently depending on its type. So in dry, there is quite slow predict progression over months or years, whereas wet is a more acute, faster presentation that can occur over days to weeks. If we move on now to the signs you'll see, in wet age-related macular degeneration, you might get a well-demarcated grey area or a subretinal hemorrhage. And in dry, you get the drusen that we've already seen, geographic atrophy, and you might get uh, atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium as well. And just to add uh, another symptom you get in wet in particular is something called metamorphopsia. So this is distortion of lines, so classically patients will be looking at uh, blinds in their house and they'll be a bit wavy. Moving on now to investigations for the condition. A patient can complete an AMSLA grid every day, which is a pictorial tool used to identify any more metamorphopsia or any scotomas, which is very useful. Uh, optical coherence tomography, which is almost like an ultrasound looking at the back of the eye uh, in between the layers for any drusen or hemorrhage. Fluorescein angiography, again, is very useful, particularly in wet neovascularization, macular degeneration. And retinal photography uh, can be used to compare how a patient's condition is progressing and is often done by optometrists, so opticians, the patients visit. Unfortunately, the management of macular degeneration is quite limited. There are some things you can do. Uh, so you can refer the patient to a macular degeneration clinic and recommend they visit the optician regularly uh, to ensure they've got the best glasses prescription if they need it to make the most of the vision that they have. Offer visual aids such as magnifiers, large print books, and help with household tasks. Consider their ability to drive. They might want some support groups, and there are a number out there that you can recommend or provide contacts for. 
consider their need to register as blind or partially sighted, which needs to be done by an ophthalmologist. Dry macular degeneration has quite limited options, but for wet, you can inject anti-VEGF such as, such as Lucentis into the vitreous humour at the back of the eye. For both of them, you can recommend high-dose antioxidants. So one of these is Vitiz2, which have been found to be beneficial in preventing progression to advanced disease in about a quarter of patients. A diet rich in the macular carotenoids, so lutein and zeaxanthin, uh, are associated with decreased risk of wet disease. So this is uh, leafy greens like spinach and kale are quite high in these compounds. And you want to control any risk factors that they have. So encourage them to give up smoking, check their blood pressure and keep it under control, uh, and watch their weight and so on. And just to quickly mention the condition, obviously as we just said this is very limited for treatment and it is an irreversible and progressive condition that affects the central vision, so it's very noticeable to patients. Uh, in patients with a normal visual acuity that's better than 6 over 60, half of these will become either blind or partially sighted over a three-year three period. And similarly, if you have untreated wet macular degeneration, uh, there's a visual acuity either 660 or worse over three years as well, risk of that. Uh, so it's a very serious condition. You need to talk to the patients about the likelihood of their vision deteriorating further. Okay, so now we're going to move on and look at cataracts. So a cataract is an opacity of the lens of the eye leading to a reduced visual acuity. Age-related cataracts cause 50% of cases of worldwide blindness and 30% of people aged 65 or over in the UK have at least one cataract causing some visual impairment, and the prevalence of cataracts rises with age. So let's draw the lens quickly to talk about the cataracts. So here's the lens there. It attaches the zonular fibres to the ciliary bodies. Uh, there's the nucleus of the lens. A cataract is due to degeneration of crystallines within the lens, and these are normally transparent proteins that sit within the fibres of the lens. They can occur in a number of places, so there's nuclear sclerosis cataracts, which occur in the nucleus, cortical in the cortex of the lens, and posterior subcapsula, which occurs in the posterior aspect of the lens. There are also other types, so congenital cataracts as well, but we won't talk about those today. The degeneration of these crystallines leads to the whitening opacity of the cataract, and reduces the ability of the lens to refract light. There are a number of risk factors influencing the development of cataract. You're more likely to get them with age, being female. Diabetics get both uh, an increased risk of age-related cataracts. There's also a particular kind of diabetic cataract as well. Steroid use, trauma, including surgery, uveitis, exposure to UV radiation, smoking and alcohol, and family history with a 55% heritability uh, in first degree relatives of cataracts. The patient will present as the sight of the teacher with a gradual loss of vision and there'll be no pain associated with this. It might be with difficulty reading or watching televisions and so on. The refractive ability of the lens is compromised and you can get glare from light and halos around light as well. And on examination there'll be reduced red reflex as the light is impaired to get through to the retina to produce the red reflex. And also, on slit lamp examination, there'll be a visible cataract. And we've got some photos of what this looks like now. So these two pictures here show a quite advanced cataracts in the, in the lens of the eye. And you can see there's reduced red reflex. So moving on to the management for cataracts, you want to consider their ability to dry. There's no medical treatment for this condition. The definitive treatment is surgery, and it's usually done by a process called phacoemulsification. Uh, there's no definitive threshold for this intervention. It depends on the, on the impact on the patient's quality of life. And I've got another video on cataracts which goes into more depth on this procedure, but essentially it involves removing the lens with the cataract in it and inserting an artificial intraocular lens. This procedure is really effective, so the 95% of patients have visual acuity of at least 6 over 12 if they're an uncom uncomplicated case. Got some photos here of uh, intraocular lenses within a patient. So this is what an intraocular lens looks like, sort of in cartoon mode. And here we've got a intraocular lens sitting within the patient's eye, which you can see. 
and another one here uh, with a red reflex behind it showing it with a bit more clarity. This is quite a common procedure cataract surgery so I thought I'd mention some of the complications that occur. So early on there are things such as posterior capsule rupture or lens capsule rupture and with loss of the vitreous humour. Trauma to the iris or anterior chamber causing haemorrhage. Uh, Post-operative infection such as endophthalmitis which is infection of the inside of the eye. Wound leak, cystoid macular edema and retinal detachment which is particularly common in uh, people who are myopic so short sighted. And some of the late complications include posterior capsule opacification, which can be treated with a laser polish, uveitis, and early worsening of macular degeneration. So that was a quick stop through cataracts. I've got another video on that if you're interested in learning more about it. Uh, but I think that'll do for the purposes of this teach. Okay, so next we'll look at diabetic retinopathy. So this is a vascular disease of the retina in patients with diabetes. And it's the most common cause of blindness of people of working age in the UK. The risk of developing the condition is related to the length of time of having diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is quite insidious in onset, so a patient may already have diabetic retinopathy when they get diagnosed. On the other hand, people with type 1 diabetes are diagnosed at a young age, and it can take years for retinopathy to set in. At 20 years after diagnosis, 80% of those with type 2 diabetes have retinopathy and nearly all of type 1 diabetics show some signs. If a patient has nephropathy, so disease of the kidneys, the retinopathy is highly likely to also be present. They correlate very closely. And both pregnancy and interocular surgery increase the risk of progression of diabetic retinopathy. So let's look at the blood supply to the retina. The retina receives its blood supply from the choroid and from the superficial retinal vessels. The choroid supplies the outer third, so this includes the photoreceptors, whilst the superficial retinal vessels supply the inner two thirds. And diabetes affects the superficial retinal vessels. If you remember, it's the disease of the microvasculature. The mechanism isn't fully understood, but it's thought to be a result of endothelial damage to the vessels, loss of the pericytes due to hyperglycemia. There's damage to the basement membrane of the vessels, and there's wall breakdown, which leads to incompetent, leaky blood vessels. Diabetic retinopathy is broadly divided into two types, non-proliferative retinopathy and proliferative retinopathy. Non-proliferative is then divided further into background diabetic retinopathy and pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. If there's involvement of the macula, this is known as maculopathy and is defined separately. So let's look a bit at the path pathophysiology of non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So this is the one that most diabetics have, it's the early stages of diabetic retinopathy. In this, there's capillary wall breakdown, which allows formation of microaneurysms. So we we'll draw them there. So that's a, you can imagine that's the retinal vessels, and microaneurysms budding off. So that's our first sign. These microaneurysms can then burst and cause what's known as uh, dots and blot hemorrhages, which form uh, the shape like an ink blot on the retina, which is due to the layers of the retina. The dot and blot hemorrhages is our second one, due to bursting of the microaneurysms. Fluid leaking between the retina and the choroid leads to edema, and that leaves behind hard exudates, like lipid deposits, when it's resorbed. And you can think of it as if you fill up a bath, leave it for a while, and then drain the bath, you get that sort of hard, scummy rim around the edge. It's a bit like that. Fluid leaks out and it leaves behind exudates when it leaves. So we'll draw some hard exudates in there. It tends to have a yellow appearance. There we go. Hard exudates is our third sign of non proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Any further damage leads to areas of ischemia of the superficial retinal, retinal nerves, and that's what causes cotton wall spots to appear. So these are sort of grey spots of ischemia of the nerves. 
That's our fourth sign, and that's the sign of pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So cotton wool spots define that. You can imagine ischemia will eventually lead to production of VEGF, which we'll go on to in a minute. So those are our four signs, microaneurysms, dot and blot hemorrhage, hard exudates, and then cotton wool spots. So to show you what they look like in practice, we've got some fundoscopy image images again. So this is background diabetic retinopathy. You can see the yellow hard exudates. And if you look closely, you might be able to see some dot and blot hemorrhages as well. This is another picture. And again, you can see more hard exudates. You can also see more clearly the dot and blot hemorrhages, like little ink blots on the uh, fundus. And finally, this is the last picture of non-proliferative. You can see some cotton wool spots as well as the hard exudates and dot and blot hemorrhages. It just shows you how severe the uh, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy can look. So let's move on now and look at proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This is a bit easier to remember than pre-proliferative. Draw another uh, our blood vessels again, put some microaneurysms on there, and we'll make some of them burst because some dot and blot hemorrhages there as well. Add some hard exudates in yellow and some cotton wool spots in blue. This is the ischemic areas of superficial retinal nerves. And ischemia leads to the production of VEGF, which is, uh, stimulates new vessel growth. And that's what you get in proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So you get these new vessels growing over the retina. And that process is called neovascularization. So that's the, the key symptom in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, is neovascularization. So here we've got a fundoscopy picture of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. You can see the neovascularization, the new vessels growing around the place. They're very thin. Uh, they're not very good. They're weak. They grow in inappropriate places, such as the macula. And they're just not very efficient at delivering uh, blood to the ischemic retina. So these vessels can grow in other places too, as well as across the retina. They can grow upwards into the vitreous, where they cause traction and can cause a retinal detachment. They can grow onto the iris. The VEGF can travel forward, land on the iris, and cause new vessel growths there, which is called rubiosis iridis. And that brings with it the problem of neovascular glaucoma, where the vessels grow into the iridocorneal angle, block it off, and cause an acute rise in intraocular pressure. So this is a picture of rubiosis iridis. You can see the blood vessels growing onto the patient's iris there. Earlier on, I mentioned diabetic maculopathy, so this is classified separately. This is what causes a lot of the vision loss in diabetic retinopathy. Obviously, the macula is the centre of the vision, as we mentioned earlier. This is edema around the macula, so the macula swells with fluid and separates from the underlying layers. So let's move on to the presentation for diabetic retinopathy. We've already got all the signs, so let's fill them in. So in background diabetic retinopathy, we have dot and blot hemorrhages, microaneurysms and hard exudates. In pre-proliferative, we have cotton wool spots. And in proliferative, we have neovascularization of the retina. In maculopathy, which may or may not be present, we have macular edema and exudates around the macula as well. If we're thinking about symptoms, uh, the patient might have gradual loss of vision, often central vision that's lost as well. But more often than not, this condition goes unnoticed with a patient having normal eyesight or an unnoticeable reduction, even with advanced disease. They may even present with some of the complications of the condition, so retinal detachment, rubiosis iridis, or neovascular glaucoma. Vitreous hemorrhage is something else that can also occur. Moving on to investigations, you should do regular retinal photography to monitor any change. Optical coherence tomography and fluorescein angiography can be useful for identifying uh, the cause. Uh, you want to do normal uh, tests such as uh, blood glucose, HbA1c, blood pressure, urea and electrolytes. And also, given the correlation with nephropathy, you should do a urine dip looking for any proteinuria and signs of kidney dysfunction. As we said before, a lot of patients are asymptomatic with this condition, and so screening is absolutely vital to detect it early on. You want to offer at minimum an annual review with uh, retinal photography, so you can compare uh, each year. And if the patient is pregnant, they should be offered it more frequently um, due to the increased risk of progression. But you should avoid fluorescein angiography in pregnant people. 
And next up, the management. So medically, you want to make sure they've got a good glycemic control, good blood pressure control, uh, aiming for less than 130 systolic uh, if there's diabetic retinopathy present, and good lipid, lipid control with statins as well. Also general advice about diet, giving up smoking, and regular exercise too. You should also refer the patient for consideration of panretinal photocoagulation, which is laser therapy, often used in sort of pre-proliferative disease. Uh, so this is a section of lasers fired around the periphery of the retina. And the idea behind it is that it reduces the oxygen demand on the rest of the retina and reduces the risk of near vascularization developing. So you're not lasering bits that are already diseased. Uh, you're trying to laser healthy bits of retina to reduce the demand of oxygen on the rest of the tissue. And the panretinal photocoagulation leaves behind scars. And this is what that looks like on fundoscopy. So it looks quite dramatic. Uh, but the aim is to preserve the healthy tissue, as we said. And this is quite a classic exam picture of what's going on here. This is what panretinal photocoagulation laser scars look like. Other treatments include focal laser treatment for macular edema, intravitreal steroids, which can be used either as a primary treatment or alongside laser therapy. Uh, anti vergf injections, as we mentioned in macular degeneration, show some benefit but are limited by NICE as they're very expensive. And surgery for complications such as retinal detachment or vitreous hemorrhage uh, as it's needed. And a quick note on prognosis. Untreated uh, patients with this condition, 50% of them are blind within two years. And 90% of them are blind at 10 years uh, if they have proliferative disease. With panretinal photocoagulation, uh, there's a 50% reduction in the visual loss. So it's a very effective treatment. Okay, so that's diabetic retinopathy in a quick nutshell. So let's move on now to look at chronic open angle glaucoma. Okay, so next we'll be looking at chronic open angle glaucoma. So this is a progressive optic neuropathy where there's both characteristic structural damage to the optic nerve and characteristic visual field defects as well. It affects 2% of people over the age of 40 and 10% of those who are over 75, though it does usually present in those who are 65 years or over. And 10% of blindness certifications in the UK are due to chronic open angle glaucoma. The pathogenesis of the condition is poorly understood, but it's thought to be progressive degeneration of the retinal ganglion nerve layer, leading to visual loss, where the optic nerve is the primary site of the injury. So if we just draw the optic nerve here, uh, the optic disc, which can be visible from the retina, let me go. so normally nerve impulses travel along the retinal nerves and down the optic nerve itself. And in open angle glaucoma, the optic nerves superficially uh, die off or degenerate for whatever reason, and this causes the disc to become thinner. And that's what leads to the finding we'll talk about later, which is known as disc cupping. Some of the mechanisms that are thought to be behind it may be poor perfusion and subsequent ischemia to the nerves. And one of the big risk factors is raised interocular pressure. So normal interocular pressure is between 15 and 21 millimeters of mercury. Anything over 21 is defined as raised interocular pressure. And this is a major risk factor of the condition. It's thought that maybe it causes the compression of the optic nerve head. And ocular hypertension, which is raised in intraocular pressure without signs of glaucoma, conveys a 10% five-year risk of developing open-angle glaucoma. So intraocular pressure that is raised is a major risk factor, but it doesn't have to be present for the condition, and that's defined as normotensive glaucoma. And a proposed mechanism for the raised intraocular pressure associated with age may be due to resistance to aqueous outflow through the trabecular meshwork, which is part of the normal aqueous humor outflow tract. It's thought to be that the meshwork kind of gets quite clogged up like, a, like an old drain and uh, prevents aqueous humour from draining properly, leading to raised intraocular pressure. So the risk factors for open angle glaucoma are increasing age, raised intraocular pressure, as we just said, family history, as this influences the aqueous outflow and the disc morphology, and intraocular pressure can also be inherited. There's a 22% risk of developing the condition if a first degree relative is affected. And being Afro-Caribbean as well, makes you more likely to have the disease, and they also tend to have more severe disease too. So moving on to the presentation, it's often asymptomatic and picked up incidentally by optometrists. You might present with a reduced visual acuity or difficulty with accommodation as pressure on the ciliary muscles 
from raised intraocular pressure leads to difficulty contracting and then changing the shape of the lens. A uh, patient may have some visual field defects. So classically, this begins in the nasal field. You can then get arcuate scotomas, nasal stepping, and focal defects and absolute defects too. On examination, you want to look for something called optic disc cupping and the ratio of the disc to the cup, which is normally around 0.3. So cupping is thinning of the neuroretinal rim of the optic disc. So normally, uh, the optic disc and the cup follow the isn't rule. So inferiorly, superiorly, nasally, and temporally is the order of thickness, with inferiorly being the thickest part of the rim and temporally being the thinnest. And the ratio, the 0.3 ratio, means that the rim is one third of the height of the entire disc. In an open angle glaucoma, the neuroretinal rim becomes thinner and the isn't rule is lost. So here we have a fundus with a normal cup to disc ratio of about 0.35. And this photo shows progression of a cup to disc ratio. So on the left with number A you have 0.2, B is 0.5, C ratio of 0.7, and D is severely cupped with a ratio of 0.9. On further examination by gonioscopy, you'll find open angles, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So you want to investigate the patient with a full slip lamp exam with gonioscopy which is the use of mirrors to look at the iridocorneal angle. So in open angle glaucoma, these angles will be open. And this is different to closed angle glaucoma, which is the acute glaucoma, where they're closed. Tonometry will also be performed, usually with a device called a Goldman Applination Tonometer, which measures the pressure in the eye, as well as central corneal thickness. You can think of it as being like tyres, so thin bike tyres, if you press them, will feel squishy, even if they've got a high pressure. Whereas if you were to kick the tyres of a tractor, say, uh, they feel hard in, anyway, regardless of the pressure inside, so they give an artificially high intraocular pressure. Something that I haven't written down which should be done is perimetry, which is a device used to evaluate a patient's visual fields. This picture is an example of perimetry, uh, which shows a superior arcuate defect with some nasal stepping as well. So the black spots is the area where the defect is present. Moving on to the management then. Uh, so this is medical management and is with eye drops to lower the pressure. And the options are quite varied. Typically you'd start with a prostaglandin. If that didn't work, move on to a beta blocker, alpha-2 agonist, and think about pedocarpine, which is a myotic, or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And some examples of these, so prostaglandins is latanoprost, beta blocker, timolol, and brimonidine is an alpha-2 agonist. And if these didn't work, then you'd move on to surgery. This is done if intraocular pressure hasn't lowered as a result of two of these medications in combination or if the patient can't tolerate any more. And the options for surgery are trabeculectomy, which is the creation of a uh, new drainage canal in the eye, or an iridotomy, uh, which is a hole into the iris to improve drainage too. And the iridotomy can be done uh, with a laser or surgically as well. Other new options include a selective laser trabeculoplasty, uh, which lasers the trabecular meshwork uh, to try and increase the outflow that way. If you have end-stage or intractable glaucoma, so it's not treated by other means, you can try a diode laser cyclophotocoagulation. And this damages the ciliary bodies so that less aqueous humor is produced, lowering the eye pressure. And so none of these treatments are aiming to treat the glaucoma itself. What they're doing is lowering the intraocular pressure, which is the only modifiable risk factor for the condition. Right, so that's chronic open angle glaucoma. Uh, one more condition to go, we're going to look at now at retinitis pigmentosa. So this is the last condition we'll look at in this teach, and it's retinitis pigmentosa. Retinitis pigmentosa is an inherited and degenerative disease where there's dystrophies of photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. Initially it affects the peripheral retina and it leads to ring scotomas and night vision disturbance. The prevalence is around 1 in 4,000. And there are multiple genes that cause the retinitis pigmentosa phenotype when they become mutated, and with a number of different inheritance patterns. So around 5 to 15% are X linked, and these are the most severe conditions usually, with central vision lost by around 30 years. Uh, 30 to 40% are autosomal dominant, and these tend to be milder conditions, with uh, vision preserved until around the age of 50 to 60. 50 to 60%, so the most of them, 
are presumed to be autosomal recessive. There are also isolated cases which occur without any family history and they occur quite commonly. In retinitis pigmentosa, the mutations cause degeneration of the photoreceptor cells, which is this layer here. And if you remember, you've got rods and cones. Usually it's the rods that are affected first. And if you remember, these are responsible for vision in, your, in dim light, whereas cones cause colour vision. So loss of the rods leads to disturbances in your night vision, or nyctalopia. Loss of the cone cells, and therefore day vision, occurs later on in the disease. And the pattern of loss is then generally mediated by the particular genetic defect, with rod dystrophy being more common. A sign called bone spicule pigmentation is pathognomic of the condition, and this is thought to be caused by budding off of the retinal pigment epithelium cells. This is the area here, and it's thought that they bud off and settle in the neural retina, forming these pigmented uh, bone spicule shaped lesions, which I'll have a picture of in a moment. How will the patient present then with retinitis pigmentosa? The condition usually starts in childhood, with symptoms that are usually apparent by age 10 to 30, but it can be later depending on the genetic abnormality. As we mentioned earlier, you get nyctalopia, which is impaired night vision, and that's due to the loss of the rod cells. And as a result of that, you also get poor dark habit adaptation. As progressive loss of the peripheral vision, this condition tends to affect the periphery of the retina, and so the patient might come in saying they're tripping over things more often as they can't see them in the outside of their vision. And later on in the disease, it becomes more advanced, it can progress to central loss of vision, and as the cone cells are lost, uh, poor colour adaptation as well. Poor colour vision, sorry. On examination, you'll see the dark bone spicule pigmentation that I mentioned earlier due to the retinal pigment epithelium budding off and settling in the neural retina. And this is what that looks like on fundoscopy. So this is a retinal photograph of retinitis pigmentosa. And you can see the, the bone spicule pigmentation that is pathognomic of the condition. You see around the peripheries you've got this dark, uh, sort of spiky, patchy areas where the retinal pigment epithelium has budded off. A number of conditions are associated with retinitis pigmentosa. So myopia, keratoconus, which is a coning of the cornea, cataract, chronic open angle glaucoma, and some systemic conditions too. Usher's syndrome is a rare genetic disorder uh, where there's visual impairment as well as hearing loss. And Olfort syndrome is a hereditary nephritis characterised by glomular nephritis, kidney disease and hearing loss as well. It can also affect the eye. To investigate retinitis pigmentosa, you want to do a full slit lamp exam and photography of the retina. I also consider an optical coherence tomography, ultrasound scan and fluorescein angiography, but the key diagnostic test here is electroretinograms, and these measure your rod and cone function across the entire retina. In retinitis pigmentosa, there's dystrophy of the rod and cones, so you're going to get reduced rod and cone function, usually with predominant rod loss. Moving on to the management, there's no uh, definitive treatment for the condition, but there's lots you can do to prevent or slow down the degeneration. So you want regular follow-up and checkups with the opticians. Uh, some people find that sunglasses help to pr protect the eyes from UV light. Think about the uh, patient's ability to drive and also genetic counselling. Uh, warn them that this might be a condition that can be passed on to their children or other family members may be affected too. In terms of drugs, uh, vitamin A or beta carotene uh, may be useful but there's no solid evidence for their use. And some patients with cystoid macular edema might respond well to oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. But they aren't routinely used in retinitis pigmentosa. And thinking about surgery, you want to manage any other conditions, so things like cataract and keratoconus. So by treating them, you can help to improve the patient's vision. And there's no definitive surgery for retinitis pigmentosa, but there are trials under being undergone uh, looking at retinal pigment epithelium transplants or prosthesis. But these are still in the experimental phase. And finally, looking at prognosis, this is a condition that progresses, but it tends to progress quite slowly. And complete visual loss is uncommon in most of the mutations, though there are some more severe mutations. Okay, so that's it for this teach on gradual loss of vision. Just do a quick summary now. So we've looked at age-related macular degeneration, cataracts, diabetic retinopathy, chronic open-angle glaucoma, 
and Retinitis pigmentosa. So in age-related macular degeneration, there are two types. There's dry, where you find drusen, and there's wet, where there's neovascularization. This condition causes central loss of vision, and the main treatment is for wet, which is with anti-VEGF injections into the vitreous. Cataracts are a condition where there's an opacity of the lens, leading to reduced visual acuity and a loss of the red reflex. And these are treated with phacoemulsification, which is a type of surgery. Diabetic retinopathy is broadly classified into non-proliferative and proliferative disease. It's often asymptomatic until quite late, so screening annually is very important. You want to aim to control their glycemic control, their blood pressure, lipids, and consider them for panretinal photocoagulation to reduce the oxygen demand of the rest of the retina. Chronic open angle glaucoma is a type of optic neuropathy where the major risk factor is a raised intraocular pressure. The patient may present with visual field defects or they may have cupping on fundoscopy and the treatment aims to lower the intraocular pressure which is the only modifiable risk factor and that's done with drops. And if that doesn't work you might move on to surgery such as trabeculectomy. And finally retinitis pigmentosa is an inherited condition where there's loss of the photoreceptors particularly the rod cells and this leads to a redu reduction in the night vision and bone spicular pigmentation and should diagnose it with an electroretinogram. There's no definitive treatment, but there are some other measures that you can take, such as uh, vitamin A or beta carotene, which may slow the progression of the disease. Okay, so that's it for this teacher on the gradual loss of vision. Hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as ever, please feel free to leave me feedback in the comments section or by email. Thanks.